Bonjour. So hello everybody and welcome to this session on youth actors of world progress. My name is Pauline Rousy. I'm an economics professor at the Ecole Polytechnique and I was invited by the Secretary des Economies to coordinate this session. So I would like to start by asking about what meaning young people have when they think of progress. It's ne not necessarily the same meaning as their parents or grandparents. What are their challenges today? What are their commitments? We've talked a lot about the environment. We've talked a lot about inequality and democracy, technological innovation and safety and security in this uh, event. So there are many combats and uh, the hierarchy may be different when it comes to you know what priority each combat takes. So I'm very happy to have this panel of guest speakers. It's a very diverse panel of guest speakers. And I think it will give us an idea of the different points of view across the world. So once we have understood better what young people want, uh, then we should understand what they're doing. What are the forms that their actions take? Uh, what are the results of their actions? From a political point of view, we're seeing uh, some fairly radical actions. So there's the uh, climate approach in Europe. There's the demonstration for the defense of democracy in Asia. There are uprisings against poverty and insecurity in Africa, leading to a coup d'etat and to bringing a new generation to power. So, uh, you know, everybody agrees that it's important to listen to youth, but in politics, things are a bit more difficult. So outside of the political sphere, there are other means of action, being enterprising, focusing on culture, transforming society. So I would like our speakers to give us different examples from their own background that illustrate once again, the diversity of actions. So, Nicola, over to you. So, we have four speakers with us today. Lily Kong will be with us on via video conference. She is in charge of the Singapore Singapore Management University. So, there are social changes, cultural changes. Uh, she's written a lot about uh, themes, uh, identity, uh, intelligent cities, education. Then we have uh, Nini Nora who represented Finland in the Future of Europe conference uh, on the 8th of May uh, 20, 000, 2021, closed in 2022, with different actions that were put forward and different collaborations. She was a member of the plenary session, Nini, and she took part in the working group focusing on questions of law and values. She's also a journalist for Tadisto, I believe, specialized in European policy. Nabila Yayush, who will be starting, is a producer. His first film was made in 1997. He represents uh, Morocco for the Oscar Awards uh, called uh, Loud and Clear. It focuses on uh, young people, hip hop. He was present in the, at the Festival of Cannes in 2021, and he's opened different cultural centers dedicated to young people. The first was in Sidi Mouven, in Casablanca. It's a, it's a neighborhood of Casablanca, I believe. There is one in Tangier and Fes, and Marrakesh was the last one that opened in 2021. Then we have Omar Victor Diop, who is with us. He started his career after the SCP. Uh, he followed the usual business-focused uh, 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 university degree, and then he got out of it just in time to become a photograph photographer. Uh, he uh, photographed uh, um, in Bamako, and he, he says that art is the only immortal dialogue between individuals. The session will be co-moderated by Pauline Rossi, who was invited by Le Cercle des Economies. When you look at uh, current affairs, we know that young people want to give meaning to their work. They want a nice work personal life balance. They want the world to be more decarbonized. They think that the promise of capitalism, you'll live longer than your parents, will not be kept. And they're beginning to express this through voting. They're sensitive to social justice. They're sensitive to the sharing of values. And they live in rich countries where their relations have changed between young people and old people. Young people have no money. Old people have money. In France, uh, we see what the, um, people live with. So we'll start 
with the handful of graduates from AgroParisTech who, who, who told uh, their universities to basically fuck off during the graduation ceremony. And they had kind of a Woodstock approach. So it's good to protest. It's good to demonstrate. It's good to be cross. But, you know, at a given point in time, you have to do something. So youth as actors of progress, what are we talking about? What do young people want? But what also, also what are they doing? Let's start, given what we've said, with this question. What is your question, Nabil? And uh, you, uh, you're very much young, close to young people. But what do they want, N Nabil? I think that is the big question, isn't it, that the adult world is asking today? It's, it's a fantasy or an obsession. You know, what do young people want? And it's a question that is increasingly crucial given the major challenges that youth are going to be facing. They're already facing these challenges, and it's an ob obsessive question, I would say. The f and what, you know, they're finding it difficult to define, and we can understand why. So young people today, um, have radical have become more radical in what they do many of them they're rejecting they're refusing many of them they've understood that uh, politics leads to nothing and we're seeing we saw this in the last elections in France in Morocco elsewhere the participation rates were historically low there, there's a kind of abandoning of the political combat that we're seeing and so there are other political combats emerging Faced with this disenchantment, young people have to reinvent themselves. And the first thing that young people want, they want to be given a reason to believe again. And it's not easy to do that. Increasingly, I'm seeing young people around me who say to me, I don't want to have children. Nabil, who is young people? Are we talking about, you know, who, who are they against? Are they against politicians? Uh, who do they want to, to give them a reason to live? Well, my daughter, let me take the example of my daughter. She's 22, and she says, Dad, I don't want to have any kids. And that was just last week. And, you know, there are many young people saying this. I can see that uh, there's a lady here, a young lady here, and she says the same thing. It's terrible to hear that. Somebody in, from my generation, hearing your child saying that, it's really difficult to accept. And yet, it's a reality, and we have to face that reality. We can't just hide it. There are other young people who decide to uh, go into the woods. They want to be dissident. They've decided that the mainstream, there's no point in joining the mainstream. Let's be radical. What can we offer these young people today? What kind of prospects can we share with them for the future? How can we help them project themselves into the future and imagine what that uh, future is going to be like for them? That is the big question that we are confronted with, and, and we don't know what to do about it. I think that the gap that there is between my generation and the generation of my daughter, for example, is much bigger than the the gap between my generation and the generation of my parents. I think it's much more difficult to understand young people today uh, com compared with my parents' generation, generation, and it's getting worse. And I think it's mainly due to this terrible plague, which is created by social media that could have played a role. They could have uh, brought it, people together. They could have opened up an interplanetary dialogue, but you know, that's not what they're doing. They've uh, taken a different path, and the young people are still closed into this world of immediacy. They're impatient. They're in a world where reading a book and taking time, seeing a long film, for example, that lasts an hour and a half, two hours, that world is a real exploit for them. It's something that uh, they find difficult to accept. So TV series have taken over, little clips on YouTube, Snapchat, they've taken over. So that young, that youth is living at a terrible rate of knots. You know, they, what's going to happen? 
they're asking themselves, what is the future going to be like and what is their role going to be? Now, I like to listen to all of these different young people. And your question is broad because the, that you have the youth in Europe, in Africa, in Asia. They have different aspirations, as you can imagine. I'm lucky to be on both sides of the Mediterranean. I w was born and grew up in France. And 20 years ago, I decided to go to Morocco to live. And I drew inspiration from my childhood that I experienced myself that allowed me, that, that made me want to go into filmmaking. And it was a, a, a youth center in the Parisian suburb where I learned to look at the world, where I learned to build the way I looked at the world at, through art and through culture. And that's youth in Morocco that I see every day, uh, with whom I rub shoulders every day. That youth wanted culture. It wanted a personal narrative. That's what was missing, I believe. So it's important to give them the, the tools so that they can talk about their own stories, so that then nobody else tells them instead of them. Because they're really very much rooted in the places where they live. And the, the terrible dramas that we've been seeing, the, the, the border between Spain and Morocco, where 23 um, immigrants were well, died. Uh, we, we don't want that to happen again, and yet it's happening increasingly. And that African youth thinks that their area is no longer their own area, where they live. They, the story has been located elsewhere. And listening to young people like that is important, I believe. Thank you very much, Nabil. So to add to what's been said, I heard young people saying, I don't want any children. And I've heard parents saying, oh, what world are we going to leave behind us? My parents never said that. So things have changed. I'm going to turn towards Omar Victor Diop with the same question. You know, what are you seeing? How do you analyze the way things are evolving? Perhaps not to necessarily badly. So it's very easy. It's Well, it's not that easy to talk after Nabil. In fact, there's a, a, a feeling, there's a, 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 an observation you know, it's the, the, of powerlessness. Young people, youths, different youths, uh, uh, people I have met in sub-Saharan Africa, they all have the feeling that they've been left by the side of the road. Uh, almost 60% of the population is under 25. So it is a, an area for young people, Africa, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. The um, young people didn't really uh, take part in decision making. And given the feeling that, that the decisions are made elsewhere, behind closed doors, by the older populations, by the, uh, well, not occult powers, but powers that were invisible, let's say, that there, there were two reactions. Uh, profound despair, first of all, which uh, encourages them to try uh, to take out all the stops and, and try anything that's, that's possible uh, uh, in order to achieve a better life. And then there are those who still hope and have the means to uh, access something different. And I think that uh, takes us to the second question. Young people want to be seen. They want to be heard. Young people simply want to have a role to play. So with the, so going beyond expectations uh, with respect to the authorities, Young people want to express themselves. They want to take part in the national conversation and in the continental conversation. Because unlike what one might think, Africa is highly integrated from the institutional point of view. So there is a lot more integration than one might think. There are forums and young people want uh, to be able to be part of those forums and ask the big questions and have an influence of uh, an influence over current issues so saving democracies strengthening democracies and uh, economic development for example so Omar Victor uh, your 
in an area where there are many, many young people. And it's the opposite way around for us. We're in a place where there are lots of older people. Yes, uh, it's a demographic uh, question. So what impact does that young does that youth have though that's that's the burning question but again uh, in the 70s and 80s there were there were youth movements that were killed in the bud I think that uh, today young people are, are not duped in this way and this is what we're seeing in the actions undertaken and that's what we'll talk about uh, when we look at the next question. Yes, the next question will focus on actions. It's all well, very well having your diploma, but you've got to do something with it. And it's not necessarily a great thing to go and, and, and demonstrate uh, next to an area where an airport is going to be set up. So, Lily, do we have you with us? Lily from the Singapore Management University. Lily Kong, are you with us? Me. Welcome, yes. welcome, Lily. Uh, what's your Thank you point? very much. What's your point? You have five minutes with us. I'm sorry, I missed a little bit of what you said. You have five minutes to speak, Lily. What do you want to say about the first questions? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity, first of all. And I'm delighted to be able to participate from Singapore on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I have listened to the previous two panelists and I'm struck by how um, perhaps in Singapore, we are uh, in a sense um, in, a, in, in an unreal world, in a different sort of world. Um, I wouldn't say that what, happening, what is happening in Singapore is characteristic of all of Asia, but I do think that much of what I'm about to say is uh, true of some other parts of Asia as well. Asia has been a growing continent economically, um, has been an interesting time politically and socially. Um, there is a growing middle class in much of Southeast Asia and indeed the rest of Asia. And so... Um, it is, a, it is a continent where there has been significant growth for a decade or so. And of course, um, the pandemic, the global pandemic has put things uh, on hold somewhat. Um, but by and large, I would say that um, this is a continent where young people um, have uh, the opportunities for growth in an economy that has been growing for a long time, barring the, the, the last couple of years. It is a, a, a situation, a continent where young people, and I'll speak for Singapore, where they feel empowered, their voices are to be heard, um, they want to make a difference. And so there are issues that they have um, particularly given their time and energies to, um, issues to do with um, sustainability in a big way. And I use that in a broader sense of the term. Uh, here is where you have young people who are very much concerned about the sustainable earth and the environment, sustainable resources. They're very much interested in ESG issues, but they're also very much interested in sustainable and resilient communities. And this is where they're very interested in issues to do with inclusivity. They want to have inclusive societies and communities, and they speak up about that. Um, they're interested in um, ensuring that the marginal and marginalized population um, are given attention, and this includes those populations that um, are living on the edge of poverty or migrant populations or those, um, you know, with, with mental health issues. Uh, these are all issues that they're very interested in. Um, they are participatory, whether it is through... Um, youth movements, or it is through community volunteer work, or it is through the development of uh, innovation and entrepreneurial ideas that can make a difference. Um, so they are interested in many issues that confront uh, the economy and society and politics, and they are very much interested in having their voices heard. Um, in Singapore, this is um, actively uh, encouraged through many dialogues and conversations led by the public sector, uh, but also 
led by private sector organizations that see their role as contributing to society. And it is definitely the role of the people sector, the non-governmental organizations, where they are active in recruiting young people into their midst. So um, it, I, I, I realize that I'm uh, striking a different tone from what other speakers have spoken about, but I hope that offers an opportunity for dialogue and debate. Thank you. questions for you, uh, Nini Nora, to close the first session. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think this has already been mentioned before, but young people shouldn't be treated as this, thank you, homogenous group. There is a diversity of opinions. And while I think it is quite clear for anyone who has followed the political discourse that young people there is an abundant demanding or the demand sustainability, especially in environmental and uh, climate issues. I think the same logic could be applied to economics as well. So I think even if young people don't yet know how to demand economic sustainability, they definitely should do that for their sake and for their children's sake. Now, I spent quite many hours debating European politics as the representative, and although I was in the working group for law and, and, and values, I think most of my time was spent on economic questions, particularly uh, the Euro area, European Central Bank, and the Euro just as a currency, which is a very very interesting and controversial a topic, even at the very early stage of establishing the currency, there were renowned economists like Milton Friedman who warned us that it would be merely a political victory and not an economic one. And sadly, he turned out to be right during the Euro crisis, the European Central Bank had to jump in to save the Euro area. And I think then the famous quote by Mario Draghi, then the president of the European Central Bank, whatever it takes, this type of mentality took place. And I understand that um, um, unconventional situations require unconventional uncon action, but it's the problem when this becomes the norm and the whatever it takes type of mentality which has dominated the Euro area and the European Central Bank policy for so long, I believe has specifically been designed so that the people responsible for those decisions will not have to accept the consequences, but simply delay them to the future generations. And the way out of this, well, we have to think about the European Central Bank, its role, should it be a silent moderator of the monetary policy, uh, or perhaps a more active, active player. But young people deserve openness and honesty, and we can't just go around picking and choosing which signs to listen to. I also believe it's simply economic growth that we need. Uh, in European Union, I hear a lot of talk about how we should be number one in innovation and technology, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, my question is, though, are we ready to accept the terms under which a very lucrative technical market can emerge in Europe? Because the fact is that if it doesn't emerge here, it will definitely emerge somewhere else. We saw this with the mobile phone back in the day when in Europe we thought that having internet access equipped mobile phones would not be a reality and then the innovations were made elsewhere. The United States, uh, Asia, they gained dominance and we have to think about how these regulations impact the market because even though they might be designed to protect us and to restrict the big tech corporations, uh, these regulations are often so tough that they prevent new potential competitors for entering the market. So we really shouldn't let let fear conduct our decision making. And I think young people, they deserve honesty, like I said, but also a clear vision, a way out. We have to abandon, we have to renounce this reactive policy making and think about the structural issues. We shouldn't dwell on the past mistakes, but we have to learn that getting too, too enchanted by this fantasy of what a united Europe should look like without looking at the facts can be very expensive, especially to, to young people, their children and the future generations. Pauline, we're halfway through our debate. So all of these young people want a, uh, uh, some good things. So Singapore at least, yes. So there are some common traits in spite of the 
different geographic areas that we are lucky enough to have on the stage today. Let's move on to the next question, Nabil. It's it's good to tell the system to fuck off, but I imagine that everything is going to happen and, and arrive on a plate. But it's important to be uh, to act on your convictions. Yes, I agree. All forms of theory uh, is not a solution. You know, reversing uh, the trends, that's not a solution uh, either. So we've got to wait and say that uh, what's on the table is not acceptable. Uh, so entrance into a school, for example. So, you know, we're waiting for you to be more in phase with the promises of the world. That's something that we need to hear. Those are things that we need to hear. Last night, I took, I, I, I participated in a great concert here. In the afternoon, I, I was on all, uh, I went to the different conferences. I listened to, to the economists, the uh, business leaders talking about uh, problems in the world. Uh, sometimes it was very interesting, sometimes it was depressing, sometimes it was striking, sometimes uh, different feelings. But when you come out of these conferences, you're very, uh, you're, you're richer, but you also have a lot of questions. And at 10 o'clock, Marcus Miller came along onto the stage uh, with his quartet, quartet, and he took everything, he took on board everybody. Everybody was mesmerized. He went into my brain, he got into my soul. There was a complete cu cure that was given. And that's why I, 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 that's how I find meaning to my coming today. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, because in these cultural centers that you were mentioning earlier on that were opening in Fez, Tangiers, Casablanca, Agadir, well, the youth that we meet there, what they do there is they embrace their own destiny through the arts. We started with all kinds of hurdles to leap over. The parents were very doubtful about what we were going to teach their children behind those high walls. Were we not going to uh, counter the education which uh, they were giving them? Were they not? Were they not? Uh, were we not going to mislead their children? It's quite difficult for the teams to kind of get themselves heard there without giving the impression that it was a culture which was coming from the top down to the bottom. We had 10% of uh, girls at the beginning, but now I'm very proud to say that we've got 50% of girls, 50% of boys. Sometimes there are even more girls than boys, all from of different backgrounds. Some girls wear the veil, some are very liberated, same for the boys. There are some are very conservative. All. Uh, types of thought, all of approaches to life are included in these centers with a very strong commitment to get away from dogma. The dogma that they might have heard by their parents, their grandparents and society. We sweep away those dogma and we invite these youngsters to jump with both feet into modernity through through art to say who they are, where they've come from, to use theatre, dance, the visual arts. It's beautiful to see all of this, to see how they cling to these centres like a, a, a life ring. It's, a, a, it's an oasis of greenery in the middle of a concrete jungle. It's so powerful. Hip-hop, for example, which is uh, you know, the prime art of expression for, for the youngsters today, which I featured in my most recent film, which I mentioned earlier on. But there, we are in a field of experimentation and expression, which is wonderful for youngsters. That's what they want. They want to be able to look forward. They want to be able to sketch out the world of tomorrow themselves because the adults can't do it for them. And I think that we're giving them the means to do that. And I think they are the only ones who'll be able to do it. And art, and the example of yesterday's concert just uh, backs me up on what I'm saying here, demonstrating that art is the way forward. Omar Victor Diop, I'm sure that what Nabil has said about uh, Nabil goes uh, straight to your heart. Yeah, yeah, I will uh, always uh, love to be uh, on a panel with you, Nabil, because it will always uh, 
You make you make things easy when when you're on the uh, stage. Yeah, I agree. Culture is an amazing avenue because we don't always need very much to be creative. And once a piece of art is created, it takes on its own life. It goes where it needs to go. And uh, cultural entrepreneurship and professionalizing culture, these are things which are really happening in Senegal. I would mention, for example, uh, Afrique Culture Urbaine, which is an association which was founded by a rapper out in Senegal. He's called Matador. And it all started with a humanitarian initiative to help families who were suffering after a flood, which was probably due to global warming. And from there, it uh, has generated over a thousand jobs. This is a place where hip hop is given a professional sheen and uh, we have uh, female DJs who start there and go out working throughout Western Africa, careers uh, on stage, behind the, the, the scene. And it's all started with the idea by a group of friends and it's grown into something magnificent and it is supported. Youth in Senegal is not left to their own devices. There is um, support. There's the so social change factory by a good friend of mine. There's a, an incubator for ideas which creates opportunities and which uh, nurtures these ideas until they become a concrete action. There's an important role of the African diaspora who come back to Africa and play a role in society. And younger generations don't have any complexes. They're not trying to be Paris or to be New York. No, they are wanting to take control of their own story. They are, and that is when you have the power. So I'm really proud of uh, everything that's going on in my country. And there's a return to farming, to agriculture. Lots of youngsters are trying to get back to the land. And quite paradoxically, uh, Africa has so much arable land. It's a continent that has a very low population in terms of numbers. It's not a dense population. But if we can save our arable land from certain foreign powers, then there again, it's another source of potential. Don't ask me who I'm talking about. That's not what I'm here to say. But on the political, political field in Senegal, we have a unique way of going about things. We go into the street, youngsters, are there. There's, there are different movements of youngsters in Burkina Faso and elsewhere applying pressure when there are elections. And whenever there is an election, the youngsters will go out to vote. They don't wait for the, um, they don't go out to wait for the uh, uh, announcements and the results on the television, but they're out on the street. They need to be encouraged, however. They don't need you to teach them anything. They just need support. And if anyone wants to join our combat, then it's by contributing to the common good. We know where we want to go, but organizing our associations, importing skills and competencies is always useful. And uh, heading in a direction to support these entrepreneurs who are involved in uh, culture and defending the environment. That, that was where you can have your impact, by helping the youngsters who know what needs to be done. Lily Kong from Singapore. About the second question, uh, what young people do to go on? Um, delighted to have the opportunity to speak to this. I would say that, um, as I was mentioning earlier, um, there is a lot of interest among young people about, you know, an inclusive society, about a sustainable planet, and so forth. And we are, and I, 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 I lead an educational institution, and I believe in the power of education. And 
through education, I refer in education, I refer not just to the classroom teaching and learning that we might assume education to be associated with, but the broader sense of education, that we are actually inculcating values in young people. We're helping them find ways of expressing themselves. We're finding them ways and supporting their um, desire to do something that makes a difference to society. And so if I were to cite some examples of what we do at the Singapore Management University, I'm really proud of our students that, you know, they take their skills to the community during the pandemic when our street food hawkers, especially the elderly ones, faced grave challenges to their livelihoods when people were not going out buying food, um, you know, off the street as they do under normal circumstances. These older hawkers were facing such difficulties. And what our young people did was to go out and help them produce the digital um, presence amongst these older hawkers so that people could actually order food um, using digital means and have delivery systems developed. So young people can use their skill sets for the betterment of the community. If they believe in a sustainable environment, then they do something about it. And it's possible through um, volunteer work where they're seeing that during the pandemic, so much packaging is in use because of delivery systems. When people cannot go out, everybody relies on e-commerce. And the huge amount of plastic waste that comes about as a consequence of that. And our students, our young people in Singapore come together, develop systems and ideas for the collection of such material so that um, they might be able to recycle and reuse material. Another example of a, an alumni from my university that has started the first startup in Southeast Asia to address the problem of plastic waste. And what they do is to produce edible cutleries that are packed with flax seed and chia seeds and whole wheat um, that gives a boost to, to you know, people using these edible cutlery. After using the cutlery for eating food, the cutlery itself can be eaten. And so what they've done is to partner with central kitchens and baking facilities to scale production. Um, another example is, is again of alumni who have started um, what they call one solution to two problems, uh, using proprietary technology to recycle plastic waste from which they create a new construction material for building road infrastructure. So our students, our alumni, put their ideas to good use. They develop startups with great ideas that can be scaled up, that can be helpful to not just the environment, but to communities, especially marginalized communities. So. As an educational institution, it is incumbent on us to provide the tools and the platforms for young people to give voice to their ideas so that they can make a difference in society. But I also want to say, and this will be my last comment, that very often the energy and the enthusiasm of youth can be misplaced. And I cite the example of young people who are so given to protecting the environment that they are pressing for actions by organizations, including universities, to divest because they believe that divestment is going to make for a better world. Well, the job of the university is to help them understand that change is not as straightforward and as simple as that. That divestment itself does not necessarily lead to the results that they want because very often all that happens all that happens is that the re there is a reallocation of shares and operations from socially responsible investors to indifferent investors and in different countries. So trying to educate young people so that they understand the complexity and the nuance so that the activism that they engage in is not just um, a lot of noise that doesn't lead to outcomes. It is not helpful if young people are engaged in what I would call performative activism or what some scholars have called slacktivism, right? There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of push for certain actions without understanding 
the implications of those actions and whether those actions actually lead to the desired outcomes that they're thinking of. So as an educational institution, there is the opportunity for us to educate about complexities and nuances. There is the opportunity for us to provide the platforms and encourage young people to put their ideas to good use for the betterment of society, community and environment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Lily Kong. Uh, Nini Nora, to conclude, before questions, maybe, and the last word with Pauline Rossi. Okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with the last speaker that we just heard before, um, at least according to, to surveys and, and data that we've collected in Finland. Uh, young people, they have become more disinterested towards the traditional forms of decision making, so voting and political parties. Doesn't necessarily mean, though, that they have become disinterested towards decision making and politics in general. They simply have their own platforms, maybe in movements, in social media, you name it. And, and this could be... In interpreted as a good thing. Perhaps we're taking a step away from the divisive party politics and um, interacting with each other, but I do have a more skeptical view too, which is about this noise without any action and how this could be, uh, how, how this could be transformed from social media culture to, to reality. As we know, this generation has grown up with a great abundance of information. We are accessing an enormous amount of it and I think this can be different or difficult for the older generations to grasp just how much information there is uh, to, be, to be accessible. And with that abundance, one has to be sometimes incredibly provocative and simplistic to gain ground, to gain visibility, to gain attention. Uh, but unfortunately, these complex and nuanced questions such as climate change, economics, immigration, social rights, you name it, they, 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 don't, they simply cannot be summarized in a flashy social media post without losing a core part of the message. But we're still doing it and it's still happening and I am certain that it is a affecting our way to have these conversations in real life. I'm, I'm not sure, I think especially many of the younger participants here have seen uh, many of these American high school movies where there are different cliques, you know, you have the sporty kids on one table and you have the nerds in the other table, I think I would be with the nerds, and then, then we have the fashionable kids in the third one. But I, I think we can spot this phenomenon of cliques, a clique being a socially close group with like-minded thinkers who are hesitant to let in new opinions, we, we, we also sense this in youth politics as well. Only we aren't dealing with trivial and light-hearted issues like sports and music preferences. No, we're talking about these huge global fundamental questions and giving them a very simplistic tone. So suddenly climate change has become a left-wing thing and economic responsibility has become a right-wing thing. And if you're part of that group, then it is out of the question for you to interact with the other ideas. And with that type of mindset, I, I'm not expecting any ambitious or good results anytime soon. And I, I would just like to approve the message with the culture, because in the time where everything becomes more technologically advanced, more impersonal, more fast paced, we need to protect our humanity, what makes us human, what makes us empathetic, and that happens via humanities, art, and, and you name it. Technologies give us the possibilities to accomplish all these things, but what is it exactly that we want to accomplish and how we interact with each other, that is determined by the more soft skills. And I think humankind has to be at least as civilized as the technologies that they utilize. So if we lose that skill of interactivity in real life, then I don't think the technological gadgets that enable us that in the digital world, that they are going to do us any good. They will simply simply encourage this culture of polarization. So I, I know young people are seizing these opportunities, but I would encourage also speculation, uh, looking into the informative side of it, questioning your own opinions, and, and trying to understand the perspective of the, the another, because we absolutely cannot afford to lose the art of disagreement and dialogue. My dear friends, 
I haven't seen any online questions. Uh, is there anyone in the room who has a question? Be brave. Why don't you ask a, a question? I think uh, there will be there will be a microphone. Ah, yes, there's a microphone. That's great. Thank you very much for this wonderful debate and for sharing your views. Thank you very much for working so closely with our youngsters. We're talking about uh, youngsters. They're looking for meaning. They're very committed to environmental causes and other causes. And we've also said that they are driven by immediate reactions that can be deformed by the social networks because uh, we're at an economic forum here. I'd like to know what your view is of youngsters' view of money. So what do you, how do youngsters view money? What's their relationship with money? We're in a consumer society. We've got you know, e-commerce with a quick click. You can buy something. So in your opinion, what is the relationship between youngsters and money? Who would like to speak out on this? Off you go, Nini. Thanks, because I actually happen to be an uh, alumni of a program that was specifically targeted in increasing young people's skills in, in money and money handling. And I, I can only speak for Finland in this occasion, but I think the phenomenon can be relevant in other places too. But I think young people in many cases, they have a very indifferent relationship with money and what that could possibly enable. At least in Finland, we have sort of a... Uh, we don't really like discussing money, and when we don't discuss something, that something um, becomes obscure, it becomes scary. Uh, the same, I think, could be said about market economy and capitalism, and how I think young people's critique towards capitalism can be often misplaced. So there are definitely structural issues in the society that are more leaning towards pro-business thinking rather than pro-market thinking, and I think it's the pro-business line that is really causing the, the problem. So say global investment protection agreements where we give special treatment to fossil, fossil fuels. Uh, that has nothing to do with free markets where competition should be fair and free. So I, I really don't think it's the problem with money or free markets. It's the problem with the incentives that we choose to place. I promised the chair of this meeting that we would finish at 12 minutes, uh, uh, seven minutes past 12. We've got until 10 minutes past 12. Would Pauline like to come in here and, and thank everyone before we all shuffle over to tent number one for the final session? Well, I'm really thrilled by this session. We've heard some very different voices from the voices that we heard in other sessions. The other sessions were perhaps very focused on France, so it's really nice to have such an international panel. We've got the, the whole globe represented here, saying that from one country to the next, youngsters might not always be after the same kind of uh, things. And uh, in some countries, uh, the economy is booming, not else, not, in others, not. And uh, I want to thank everyone for inspiring all the youngsters uh, to take all kinds of actions to reach the objectives that, that they have set for themselves. And thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lily Kong, Nini Nora. Thank you very much. Mami, Omar, and Pauline, Victor, as well. Thank you very much for this round table. Enjoy the rest of the event here in X. We're going to have our final declaration very soon. I can tell you that it's going to be a big document, so don't miss that event. Thank you.